inspire. Welcome back to Starting Now, the show about getting started on your next idea. I'm Jeff Saris. This week, I'm talking to Paul Saladino. We're talking all about the carnivore diet because Paul Saladino is the carnivore MD. Paul's an entrepreneur and um, a promoter, one of the one of the faces of the carnivore diet. And if you're not familiar, the carnivore diet is one where you eat only animal-based products, no plants. And it's interesting because it really is, it's a way to treat a lot of illnesses as we'll dive into in this episode. You can thrive on a carnivore diet, not just survive. So after diving into that, we also talked a little bit about what it's like to be an MD entrepreneur. And we even got a sneak peek at Paul's latest endeavor. It's a really, a really great conversation. I know you're going to enjoy it. So without further ado, Paul Saladino. The biggest question, of course, you're the carnivore MD. That's the <laughs> carnivore diet. Why don't we need plants in our diet? So we can attack this from a number of different perspectives, but yeah, I I have come to be known as the carnivore MD. It's a, it's a moniker that I'm proud of now, but it's kind of a radical concept, right? Like everyone thinks we need plants. And I think that if you ask most people, why do we need plants in our diet? They would tell you because of nutrients. You know, at the highest level, we need plants for nutrients, for vitamins and minerals. But if you really look at the nutritional science, that's not true, actually, because and the reverse is actually, in fact, the majority of the time, even more true. And by that, I mean that animal foods are this incredibly nutrient, both dense and bioavailable source for every single nutrient and vitamin and mineral that we know of that humans need. And that's, that's a pretty controversial statement, but it's easily backed up by solid nutritional literature and we can go through all of them. And in many cases, in the majority of cases, animal foods are actually much better sources of these nutrients than plant foods. And then ironically, the last part of the equation that's lost too often is that a lot of the time plants actually prevent us from absorbing nutrients that are in them because they don't really want to get eaten in the first place. So plants have anti-nutrients, oxalates, phytic acid, which can do this sort of chelation process of biting minerals. There's lots of great studies with zinc and iron and other divalent cations, these are minerals with a positive two charge, that show that when you eat those minerals in animal foods with plant foods, specifically things like beans or tortillas in, in one specific experiment, which have lots of phytic acid or oxalates, the absorption of minerals like zinc goes down and then almost to nothing if you eat enough of the tortillas and, and beans. So pretty interesting stuff, right? And so you think, well, if you don't need plants for vitamins and minerals, why are we eating plants? And so the next level of the onion is people will say, well, don't plants have like phytonutrients or like special magical nutrients in them? <laughs> I take the controversial uh, status quo rebuking stance that they don't really, that we've kind of misinterpreted what these molecules are doing. And most of these molecules, when you actually look at them, are plant defense molecules. They're molecules that are made by plants to dissuade insects, animals, fungi from eating them for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And for some reason within our health sphere, we've decided to make these things valuable nutrients or at least phytonutrients or magical molecules. And I'm not really sure where that came from. I suspect that a lot of that narrative comes from supplement manufacturers, uh, who are looking to create the next molecule or the next supplement, whether it's curcumin or elagic acid from raspberries or et cetera, sulforaphane or resveratrol. And all of these molecules, um, curcumin is actually a plant pigment, but sulforaphane, resveratrol, these are plant defense molecules. And so the assumption that these are good for us is a little premature in my opinion. So in the book that I wrote, The Carnivore Code, I kind of unpack this argument and kind of weigh both sides and say, are we really sure these things are good for us? Because I don't think they are. And there's pretty good science to support that notion. So a lot of controversial ideas, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And you've you've sort of made your name on this controversy because this is a, a disputed area. But as you said, the science is there. I mean, that's 
it feels like this is where we should be coming from, which why I'm really excited to, to dive into this, dive into more about your journey and the entrepreneurial side. Um, but yeah, I come from the paleo space. And we have a mutual friend, Josh, who introduced me to, to your work. And he was like, yeah, I think you're going to be on board with this because we've talked a bunch like over the years. And I was always coming from plants, animals, nuts, and seeds, like in that order of importance. But one of the things that we really that really connected when I first heard your message was you're talking about even more. You're talking about quality of food. You're talking about like the, the types, I mean, granted, meat, 100% meat and like animal-based products, but the quality definitely matters. In terms of your approach then, 100% meat, you haven't had plants, I'm assuming, in a while. What does that look like? Yeah, so this is the question everybody wants to know. <laughs> the caveat here is always the way I do it isn't the way that everyone needs to do it. And I think that the my fear with the carnivore space is that people will think that I'm saying that everyone on the planet should stop eating plants. And I don't think that's realistic, nor do I think that's necessary. So I'll just back up one space and kind of frame the discussion in terms of what I think is important to think about as we are imagining or sort of diving into the realm of animal-based diets. And the first premise that I try to make in the book, that's the first edition, the Carnivore <laughs> Code. The second edition will be out August the 4th. Um, the first premise that I'm really making, or the first sort of thesis that I'm advancing in the book is animal foods, red meat especially, have been incorrectly vilified, unjustly criminalized for the last 70 years starting with Ansel Keys, starting with the misinterpretation of the epidemiology surrounding saturated fat, which has now been corrected, but the general public has been essentially brainwashed for 70 years into thinking that red meat is bad for them in some way, shape, or form. And yet, if you really look at the medical literature, there is not a single interventional real science experiment study that shows that red meat is bad for humans. And yet, if you look at 10 people on the street and do a survey, at least nine of them is going to tell you that red meat is bad for them. So we've clearly been fed a narrative, which I believe is very untrue. And beyond being untrue, I think it's damaging for our health because of all these critical nutrients that are in red meat and animals that are left out if we forego these foods. So first thesis in the book, red meat is incorrectly vilified, an essential integral part of every human diet, has been for three to four million years. To thrive, humans need these nutrients in our diet. The second thesis is the plant side. And it says, hey, plants exist on this planet within an ecosystem. They're rooted in the ground. They don't have defense mechanisms. Some of them have spikes or thorns, but most of them don't even have those. And so what have they done in the last 450 million years of coevolution with animals? They've evolved myriad, hundreds of thousands of chemicals, many of which we talked about already a little bit, which we've interpreted as beneficial for humans, but are actually plant defense chemicals. Now, there's probably variable amounts or variable degrees of human sensitivity to these chemicals, meaning that some people can handle some of them better than others. But by and large, it's really not debatable that plants are full of toxins and that they're generally not looking to get eaten by humans. Animals aren't either, but they can run away and kick or bite or you know, you know, use their antlers. Plants have nothing but these chemicals. So from those two frameworks, we emerge with this paradigm whereby instead of being plants, animals, nuts, and seeds, it's like animals are the central food for humans, especially animals eaten nose to tail, and plants are survival food. And I think that's the way it's been for all of our evolution as humans, that if animals could be obtained via a successful hunt, that would have been our preferred food bar none. And if we couldn't hunt animals, we might go forage favoring some parts of plants over others. And we can get into the least toxic parts of plants and some idea of a plant toxicity spectrum later on if you want. But these are patterns that have been observed in recent history with indigenous hunter-gatherer groups, and they are patterns that seem to be consistent with their history as far as we know going back. And I think there are anthropologic studies uh, and archeologic studies that sort of uh, corroborate this in terms of human history going back even thousands, tens of thousands, potentially millions of years based on stable isotopes in bones and collagen of humans. So. It's kind of a reordering of the priorities, right? We get the animal foods, they make up the central part of our diet. We eat them nose to tail, including the organ meats. We use plants as survival food, or in today's world, we use plants as entertainment, color, texture, appreciating that they exist on a spectrum of toxicity. And if we, if you or I are not thriving, 
we should consider the fact that perhaps all the plants we are eating are not treating our bodies as well as they could be. I always kind of couch everything or frame everything from the perspective of, hey, look, I'm not really dogmatic about a carnivore diet. If someone is listening to this and thriving, why would you change anything? But I think that the majority of people in their lives can look at something, whether it's sleep, body composition, libido, lean muscle mass, mood, autoimmune conditions, GI symptoms, and say, I wish I didn't have that. And I just want to offer an option to people that might be a useful lever to pull to get to that next state of health. And it's something that hasn't been considered because plants have been held as sacrosanct for so long, and no one's even considered the fact that maybe they're not as good for us as we believe. And certainly, they should not be the focus. They should just be on the periphery. So with that in mind, my diet personally is, I would say I'm the astronaut, right? Like <laughs> I'm the guy at the front of the boat steering the ship. So you better believe I eat a carnivore diet. In the last two years of doing an animal-based diet, I've had plants on a few occasions, mostly as an experiment. But I would say 99.8% of the days over the last Two years, I've had no plants in my diet, zero, zero fiber, zero plant foods. And I, I have pooped every day because I know you're all <laughs> wondering. And, and I'm not spontaneously combusting and I, and I don't have tons of oxidative stress and I check my blood markers all the time and they look great. So it's really contrary to the mainstream paradigm at this point. But in the book, I present five tiers of a carnivore diet, starting with something that's a little more approachable for people, something carnivore-ish saying, all right, make animal foods the center of your diet and then make plant foods the survival food, thinking about them on a toxicity spectrum. And then I advance people if they want to cut out more plant foods, you know, incorporate more organ meats. And then you get to where I am, which is an entirely animal-based diet. So basically I eat two meals a day and I, I enjoy these meals very much. Many people will hear these and they'll think that's gross or I couldn't do that, but that's just, you know, the question's been asked, so I'll tell you how I eat. <laughs> video on my website, carnivoremd.com of how I eat in a day. So I'll eat two meals a day. I do time-restricted feeding. I generally eat breakfast and a late lunch. I don't do dinner. So for instance, here in Texas, it's 4.30. I ate dinner about two hours ago and I won't eat for the rest of the day. But twice a day, I'll eat about a little less or a pound of meat. I'll start with a grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised meat, and it can be a variety of cuts. Recently, I've been doing stew meat. I like how collagenous it is. And I'll blanch it in some bone broth that I made with some connective tissue. And then to that, I'll add a few eggs. Usually, I just eat the egg yolks. And I'll have some organ meat. I like liver and whatever else I can get my hands on. I like thymus. I like spleen. This is where people get grossed out. I'll <laughs> eat testicle if I've got it. I'll eat whatever organ meats I can get from the farms that I source from. But I'm very intentional about the place I get these foods. I use Redmond Real Salt. And in the last few months, I've been incorporating carbohydrates back into my diet. And this was part of the plant experiment that I had. I wore a continuous glucose monitor from a company called NutriSense, which was really interesting and allows me to see my blood sugar in real time. And I, I, did, I ate some plants during that just to see how my blood sugar would respond. And I also ate honey. And what I found was that my stomach, my GI system feels best on honey. So it's a non-fibrous hmm. carbohydrate. What I found after a year and a half of zero carb, quote, uh, you know, carnivore was that I felt pretty good, but it was just very hard to maintain my electrolytes with such low levels of insulin that happen with a zero carb diet. It's really hard for the body to hold on to sodium. And when we lose enough sodium, your body starts to waste magnesium, potassium. People on long-term strict, less than 20 grams a day, ketogenic diets, they end up with electrolyte abnormalities invariably. So what I've come to discover is that, hey, ketogenic diets are very helpful. Um, removing carbohydrates in the diet can be very helpful for someone who has metabolic dysfunction. But I think cycling in some carbohydrates to get some insulin spikes occasionally is good for the body's physiology, specifically electrolyte maintenance. You could you know, even make an argument that honey is carnivore because it's from bees. It's not really a plant food. So that's my diet right now. There's no technical like plant leaves, roots, seeds, or nuts. Um, there's no fruit and it's all animal foods plus some honey during the day. And that's really what I do. The carnivore-ish type diet is, is kind of the same thing with the least toxic parts of plants. And we can talk about that if you want to. Yeah. So, I mean, so much, so much to unpack there. It's just I awesome. <laughs> like, no, I love it. I mean, it's, 
it's really an exciting topic. I, I find it very fascinating. For someone who was just going to start out and give it a try, I, maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit with this, but is there a balance between um, going partially in and in carnivore and having the benefits? Or is it sort of an all or nothing thing? Like you mentioned in the book, you have sort of phases, but do you see the the uh, like medical benefits of carnivore depleting dramatically when it's uh, a partial approach? Or um, how do you feel about that? It depends on the individual and what you're trying to treat, right? I think for most people, incorporating more well-raised red meat into your life is going to be a health upgrade. And if people don't want to eat red meat or they don't believe in red meat, then I would encourage them to look at my other stuff or to read the book as I have gone to great lengths to exonerate this incredibly valuable food. Chicken and turkey and pork are also meats, but as I've been talking about recently on my social media, they're not raised with a species appropriate diet. So they're not my favorite meats. I don't want to create impediments for people, but I also like to show them what the ideal would be. And the ideal, in my opinion, is to eat as many animals as you can that are eating species appropriate diets. So having said that, I think the more animals that you incorporate into your diet that are eating their own respective species appropriate diets, the better you will do because you'll get more of these nutrients. Now, that's the first step. And then the second step is pulling out foods that may be triggering you immunologically will also have you improve your health. So you can do it anywhere along the continuum that you want. And I think that you don't have to go all the way to carnivore in the beginning. And I think for a lot of people going partially doing a carnivore-ish type diet, which is centered upon well-raised animal foods, and then um, thinks about which plant foods might be most offensive is a great way to start. And for a lot of people, completely eliminating fiber is a pretty jarring change for them gastrointestinally. For some people, it's very, and it's a huge improvement in their GI system. For other people, it's a little too abrupt and tapering down the fiber is more, uh, more feasible or more recommendable. So I think that it's, you can, people can decide what they are looking for and find themselves anywhere along that spectrum. The, the caveat there, and really the context is then that if someone has an autoimmune issue and you don't get an improvement in the autoimmune issue, you may need to go further along that spectrum and dial it further over and say, well, I'm still eating some plants. Maybe I should get rid of those and see if the autoimmune issue goes away. The other thing I'll say here is that plant foods are not the only foods that can trigger autoimmunity. I've found clinically and personally that milk can be a trigger for some people and that egg whites can be another trigger. And that sometimes for people traditionally raised, I mean, traditionally in the negative sense, traditionally raised pork or chicken, or even sometimes non grass fed, grass finished meat can also trigger them. So the quality of the food is important. And I, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be so um, black and white and say that animal foods are good and plant foods are bad. A lot of foods can trigger immunologic reactions. And, and I find in the animal space, it's mostly dairy and egg whites. Beyond that, it's much less common to have other reactions. But within the plant spectrum, I just find that more plant foods trigger people immunologically. So figuring out what works for each individual will be at the root of, I think, advancing them from a health perspective and figuring out where on that spectrum they lie in the best way is, is beneficial. You don't have to go the whole way. Yeah. Is there anything that you miss? Do you miss coffee, chocolate, or especially early on, maybe? Was that, were there any things that you were just like, ah, I feel good, but? You know, I think that um, I was ne I've never been a coffee drinker. I drank coffee when I was in graduate school and it made me feel jittery and I got heart palpitations. So I haven't had coffee in a long time. Uh, I've known from even before my carnivore days that chocolate triggers my own autoimmune issues, which are eczema. Mm -hmm. So I don't really miss chocolate. And um, when I first started carnivore, I did go to the grocery store and look at fruit and think, that looks really good. Eventually it, it went away and I was fine. Like I said, I even reincorporated fruit in my diet recently and, and didn't find it to be revelatory or you know angelic in any way, shape or form. Um, so I may be a mutant. I may be a little bit of an alien <laughs> or a little bit OCPD in this respect or have a very rigid or obsessive brain, but I don't miss much. I think that uh, for me, it's a lot of how we frame it. And this really brings up conversations about our relation to food and how much of the food we eat is being used as entertainment versus nourishment. And that's not for me to judge on someone else. Who am I to tell someone what defines their quality of life? But 
I think that we all have to individually weigh um, our health and our uh, medical outcomes or our, you know, personal quality of life from a health perspective versus our personal quality of life from an entertainment perspective. And for me, the, the lever has always been, or the scales have always tipped toward the performance. You know, I, I do jujitsu. I, I like martial arts. I like to surf. I like to ski. I want to be outside. I want to look good and feel good and think clearly. And, and for me, like, you know, I, I am, I'm just, I feel very fortunate and happy that I get to eat something as delicious as, as red meat every day. And I don't, I don't miss anything else. And when I, I think that if I were to eat something that was junk food or a cookie, it just wouldn't even be enjoyable to me. It might taste good and give me a little dopamine buzz for 30 seconds. And then the, the aftermath hits me very hard. I think, why did I do that? I just feel crappy. I hate that equation. It's an, I don't, I don't drink alcohol for kind of the same reason. It's never been worth it. I've never personally been willing to trade short-term enjoyment for long-term suffering. And that's just the way that I, you know, solve the quality of life equation personally. And I think everyone has to take a, a real um, clear look at how they're solving it for themselves in that, in that sense. Absolutely. So what does your practice look like? I know it's, it's a little unique because you do, especially now, um, remote uh, consultations and things. What does that look like from the, like the business side of things as the, um, as the carnivore MD? You know, when people ask me what I do now, I just say that I'm a writer <laughs> and they say, you're a writer. And I say, yeah, I guess I'm a doctor too, but mostly I'm a writer. And, um, since writing the book, I've really felt most comfortable and most like I'm doing my best work when I'm sharing ideas and sharing content. So most of what I do is writing and talking and making videos and producing my own podcast, Fundamental Health. <laughs> and, and, you know, working on the second edition of my book and then working on the cookbook now and working on other business projects. So I, I think that at this point, maybe 15 to 20 percent of what I do is, is business as a physician where I'm seeing clients and some weeks, 95, 80 to 95 percent of what I do is is creative stuff and writing. So I'm mostly a writer and a talker now and, and less of a doctor, but it's I'm always thinking about those medical things from that perspective. Within the medical sphere, I, I do do consults for people. Um, my practice is, is full right now, but I have a set of clients that I do see virtually. Um, over the last couple of years, it's been very, uh, very revealing and a great learning experience to work with people and to see what works and what doesn't. And to see a lot of cases of people doing really, really well with this diet, which is great firsthand. And I mean, I've seen people, I have two uh, twin uh, men who are my clients and they had eczema like head to toe going carnivore, they resolved at 95%. Um, I have clients with very severe suicidality within bipolar that have done much better from a psychological and psychiatric perspective. Um, clients with fibromyalgia, clients with other skin issues, psoriasis resolved. Um, I had someone with, uh, you know, just all kinds of autoimmune issues that improve. And these are people who have never seen anything else, in, you know, be efficacious. I had a gentleman that emailed me the other day. I don't work with him specifically, but he told me about his carnivore diet. He had postural um, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome known as POTS, and it, it limited him to a wheelchair. And mm -hmm. now changing his diet to nose to tail animal based, he's essentially living a normal life from, from that sort of um, blood pressure perspective and can walk around and exercise and do things. It's really pretty striking the things you see. So that's been really cool. And um, I've come to a point where I realized that that the best work that I can do in reaching the most people is, is not by seeing people one-on-one, -on -one, though I love it. I, I've gotten really trying to hone the skills for writing and, and, and working in a little bit bigger sphere right now. And doing it that way, you are. You can connect with such a bigger audience. I mean, you can help more people than ever before. Yeah. What what was that transition like? How, because I mean, you come from like the medical world, you come, you've done like what you were doing before and what you're doing now is seemingly dramatically different. How did you navigate that? Oh, it's challenging because I didn't know anything, you know, Josh <laughs> gave me a lot of pointers and <laughs> how we navigate. And you, you kind of just, I think you heard that saying, you grow wings on the way down or you, you know, you build the airplane on the way down. And I think for me, I, I thankfully found pretty quickly that 
some of the things that I was saying gained traction and people resonated with and found value. And so I just kept doing more of it and more of it and had to learn as I went, what works, what doesn't, how do I connect? What's the mistake? How do I navigate trolls and people being negative? It's, it's been a challenging journey, but it's just been piece by piece. And I, I honestly think that um, it's been, it's been perhaps easier for me because I like being in front of people and I like public speaking. Um, like I said, I'm an alien. I don't know, but I, I've always <laughs> liked performing. I, I never did drama or performance art when I was in school, but I, I, I really respect comedy and people that can stand up in front of people and talk clearly and make clever, you know, connections between things and connect with their audience. And so I've always enjoyed that and giving talks and sharing ideas with people has been something that I enjoy. So it's kind of a natural progression. It's something I, I like. I, I like talking to groups of people. Um, I think I like talking to bigger groups rather than one person in general. So it's been, it's been something that I gravitated toward. And I thought, oh, I'd, I'd rather do this. I mean, I love talking to my clients individually, but if I can talk to a room of 30 or 300 or 30,000, it's just, it's more interesting for me. I kind of feed on that. Maybe I missed my calling as like a rock star, but I have no <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, what are some of the ways that you then honed those skills as you were like growing your wings on the way down? Oh, good question. Um, I think just doing it, just doing it over and over, uh, looking to see who was doing it well and just repeatedly doing it. I, I think that at this point, and this has all happened pretty quickly, <laughs> um, you know, it's really happened in the last two years, but I think in the last two years I've, I've done you know, who knows how many podcasts, maybe two to 300. Um, my, my show has 64 episodes and I've probably been on 250 plus other podcasts. And so just, you know, reps, you know, exercising mm -hmm. the muscles and, and thinking about it is, is where I get my most creative ideas. And there are a lot of things that I've come up with that have happened in the moment on a podcast. And I think, Oh, I like that idea, or I like that concept. And I'll kind of think about it more offline and then develop it. And, and then writing actually has helped me develop ideas too. So for instance, with my social media content, it's just happened organically. I'll just start writing um, for one post and I'll get an idea for another post as I'm developing my ideas. So it's like the ideas have to flow. I think I've heard Tim Ferriss talk about this with writing his books. He doesn't try to write a, you know, a page or an hour. He just tries to write for five minutes. And so for me, it's like, I'll go on Twitter. Like this morning, I just went on Twitter and I just started tweeting. And I was like, what do I want to tweet about? I'm just going to tweet ideas. And then as I'm down the thread at the third or fourth tweet, I'll be like, oh, that's what I really wanted to say. It kind of comes out or I'll come up with something clever because I mean, ultimately that's what we feel like we're doing, right? I have to say things in the most concise, most resonant way for people to have it reach them. And so as I'm doing it, even in, in real time, in real life, I'm refining, refining, refining. And often it's the fourth tweet in the thread that I'm like, that's the tweet that should have been first. And I'll retweet that one first in another <laughs> thread. And that one gets more traction. I'm like, okay, that's what people really wanted to hear. It took me five tweets to develop it. And I think that writing the book was that way. You start writing and then you're like, oh, that's what I want to say. The same thing with speaking. You know, I, I love doing these podcasts because it keeps me sharp and it's just rehashing the ideas over and over. I'll come to something or I'll think, I really should research that one piece more um, as I'm doing it in the moment. So that's kind of my, that's been my process, just doing it. I, I guess this is how we all do things, but um, I just, you just end up doing it in real time and then you create a podcast and, you know, sometimes they're good and sometimes they, they stink, but at least you're trying. I mean, how many times did you fall off your bike, you know, learning to ride it? We all have to do this. And I think that people just don't do it. They're afraid. And, and I was that same way. Like, what if people don't like this post? And it's like, I don't, I don't even care anymore. I'm just going to throw it out there. And you know, people like Gary Vee have talked about just, just say something and just try to be honest and authentic with it. And if people resonate, you'll see that. And then, you can, oh, okay, that's what I should do more of. Or that that's start to find the voice. But I think that was the key in the beginning. I just had to do it enough to find the voice. And I'm still refining that. And I like to call it high intensity interval creating where you're going yeah. all in. You're just diving in and you're hitting it hard, but then maybe dialing back a little bit. What doesn't work? What doesn't like resonate with you? And have you found then, because it sounds like you're just going, 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 have you found a point of maybe, maybe not burnout, but noticing where you found your boundaries, your limits? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been a pretty challenging last couple of years, the last year, especially very challenging. And I've felt burnt out a lot of times and not understood why. And then 
uh, felt better about it. But yes, absolutely. And in that case, and I think this is critical for everyone to have, but it's never talked about that it's, it's important to have that thing that you love outside of it. And whether for me it's surfing or wake surfing or martial arts or something, if I stop doing that, then I just don't have as much fire on the other stuff. So I, right now I'm in Texas and I'm, I haven't been surfing as much, but I'm hoping to meet people with boats or get out wake surfing more. But, but being in the lake, I mean, it's, it sounds trite, it sounds passe, but it's so true. Like being in the lake is going to totally fill my cup to do this other stuff. It makes me so much more able to be um, persevering and kind of, you know, grind when things get hard if I'm doing those other things I love that are completely outside of it. And I think that we all lose this. And that's been my struggle, losing those things I love by getting kind of sucked into this dopaminergic wheel of social media. I mean, once you're a creator and you start to create and you, you get a little bit of feedback that's positive, it's a really addictive drug. You're like, whoa, people like that. I got to do that a lot. <laughs> you just think, you just think like, I'm a, you almost feel like you're on a hamster wheel. Like I have to do more of that, more of that, more of that. Because sometimes you can see that the more you do, the more people engage and you're, it's almost like you're, you're just, you're just making donuts or something. It's the worst analogy ever. Cause there's no donuts here, but you know, you're just like, <laughs> I just got to make more donuts, make more donuts. And, and you forget that, 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 that for me, at least it's better when it comes from a place of creativity. I don't see it as much, but I think other people have told me that the content or at least my energy is better when I've taken time off. And, and I think that's, that's not surprising. Yeah, it makes sense. And are you based out of Texas now or are you just there temporarily? I am here now. Yeah. Oh, nice. What part? Austin. Oh, perfect. I love Austin. Yeah. How it's long have you been spot. there? Yeah. I've only been here for a month now. Oh, nice. Yeah. What made you leave? Because uh, you were in San Diego. Yeah. So hard to leave San Diego, but, um, you know, it was, I had a lot of friends here, so it was community and I'm interested in having a little more space maybe having a ranch or land or, you know, I, I like to hunt. I'd like to be closer to hunting and open space. And um, yeah, California just felt like it was time to go. And I missed the surfing in the ocean, but I, I wanted to be somewhere in Austin is obviously urban, but I wanted to be somewhere where I could get out into open space a little bit easier. And you can do that in San Diego too, if you drive East, but something was appealing about Texas and the community that I already had here. And so I'm excited to explore it. And then you know, just having a little bit more, uh, a little more freedoms, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. California's getting a little crazy. <laughs> um, so to rewind just a little bit, you mentioned tweeting, tweeting, tweeting. How do you approach just the blank screen? You mean the blank tweet screen? Yes, yeah, starting from nothing. That like, where do you get the inspiration for that first tweet? You said it grows over several, but first tweet, first uh, page of when you're writing for five minutes, even like, where do you find that you you get that inspiration from initially? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think it's mostly from curiosity and rabbit holes, and I, I never look at the blank Twitter screen and think, "What am I going to tweet?" Just like I never think, I never look at Zoom and think, what am I going to make a video about today? <laughs> it's almost like I just, I get so many ideas. I'm like, I have to tweet this idea. You know, you get full of this idea. And I, I've, I've started doing these videos on my social media, which are called controversial thoughts. And it'll just be like, I have to do this. Like I, if I don't do the video, I don't feel good. I have these ideas and I'm kind of lining them up in my head. And it's just, it's just, pregnant, you know, it's just totally ready to burst. It's like a ripe fruit or, you know, it's just time for this, this fruit to be harvested. It just kind of grows over time. And every day is a little different. Every week's a little different. I end up doing a few videos a week, but I did two. I did one yesterday, one today, two in a row. But it's like, I think you just, you generate the content by being curious and by researching and thinking about things without the intention of generating content, you know? So I'm doing, there's just something that interests me right now polyunsaturated fatty acids, specifically linoleic acid and saturated fat. And I just want to, I mean, like, you know, when I'm not doing something else, I'm like, I need to read more about that. I'm really fascinated by this. So I'm reading about it. I'll read an article and that'll give me an idea. And then that'll give me, you know, that'll connect to something else. But it's this, it's this very non-deliberate organic process of just doing what I find interesting in a creative sense. And that's also the balance too, between creating and researching and finding time to create or to produce content that's outfacing 
and just to be completely secluded or focused, which is harder and harder today, um, and just do research that nobody's ever going to know about and just sit at my desk for a few hours or a day and, and do nothing that produces anything of substance, but just to research things, to go down rabbit holes, to have curiosities. It's a luxury. And the entrepreneur in me gets a little stressed thinking, I'm not doing anything. I didn't make a single video today. <laughs> you know, I'm doing today. What did I produce? Um, but those often end up being sort of the, the, the fertilizer, the roots, the soil from which the ideas germinate later. Um, but it's a scary thing because, you know, as creators, if you don't create, how are you relevant? What are you doing? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And speaking of, as an entrepreneur, how do you make money then? How do I make money? Well, um, the book was very good. So um, <laughs> having having a book that did, I mean, I, but I didn't know that was going to happen, right? I spent eight months. Really, I wrote the book in about five months and then I spent a few months editing it. And now the book um, did really well as a self-published book. Thank you to you guys for all of the help that you did in, <laughs> in assisting with the, some of the graphic design and, and that kind of stuff in the book. But uh, it did so well as a self-published book that uh, a big publisher, HMH, Houghton Mifflin, bought it. And the second edition is coming out. So I have book revenue, which is great. And more importantly, I'm excited that the message is reaching more people. The podcast has become popular enough to generate some revenue. I get some revenue from the clients I see. And um, then those are the main revenue streams. The content I produce doesn't really make revenue in and of itself. I mean, YouTube will make a small amount, but it's really just enough to pay for the production of that content. Uh, it's nothing lucrative. And the podcast is not lucrative yet necessarily. It's just kind of all um, for the sake of keeping the boat afloat. And so those are the main things. But on the entrepreneurial side, I've also got some businesses that I'm building as well which will sort of uh, be built upon the ideological foundation that I've created now. Now, I had no intention of doing that in the beginning. It just sort of has grown organically. But you're right. It is, it is challenging to make the revenue. And I think that um, for me in the beginning, having the ability to see clients was great because it gave me something to keep the boat afloat while I was doing things and I was learning. And then things gradually became um, a little bit more of an income stream that was coming from the content. And now... We're at the uh, we're at a turning point where um, the book is is a good amount of revenue. The next books are revenue, and then the business is going to be the main revenue stream as it helps people get into this lifestyle. So it's a but that's a challenging sort of inertia driven stone. You know, like that stone has a lot of inertia to get it going. Definitely. Um, are you able to uh, say anything about the business that you have in the works? Yeah. When is this podcast coming out? Um. Probably two weeks, three weeks. Two or three weeks. All right, yeah. By then, the business should be about going. It'll be close. <laughs> <laughs> and I can always cut this out if we need to, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the business is, um, it's called Heart and Soil, and it's a supplement company. One of the things that I've noticed that's most challenging for people in their lives is getting organ meats. And so I'm super passionate about organ meats and eating nose to tail. I kind of mentioned that earlier. And I've really discovered that, you know, people are, if the first hurdle is getting people to believe that red meat is not bad for them. And the second hurdle is often um, equally large. And that's, you know, convincing people that the organ meats that they've never seen anyone eat or that their grandmother ate, but that they think are gross, like liver and heart or sweetbreads, thymus are actually really good for them and an integral part of an animal-based diet. So the, the, the really easy, interesting solution is you can desiccate. You can low temperature dehydrate these organs and make pills of the organ. There's nothing else in there, but like it's, it's different than dehydrating because the temperature is so much lower because you lower the pressure, but you can desiccate the organs and you can give someone a pill with pancreas or thymus or brain or spleen or liver. And they're just, it's just such an interesting, immediate, efficient way to get nutrients from these foods that you wouldn't otherwise eat. I've grown accustomed to eating these foods, but most have not. So I'm super passionate about giving people better access to these foods and then the health outcomes that will follow. So we are going to have a whole line of different sort of organ meats. And yeah, so the website is heartandsoilsupplements.com. And I'm super excited about that. It's kind of my passion project. And then we're sourcing it from the best farms we can find. So that's the, the two pieces that I'm most passionate about are nose to tail organ meats from 
grass-fed, grass-finished, regenerative farms starting in New Zealand and then developing a supply chain in the U.S. because there are these farms in the U.S. and we want to support them here. So that's what I'm doing on that front. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an exciting project, but challenging. And yeah, I really like that. What does it look like in terms of the supplement then? How many, like, obviously they're not going to be massive pills, but how many would you have to take to get the, the, the benefits from having the organ meat in that way? Yeah. So when you, when you do the conversion, you know, these are like one gram capsules and some people have trouble swallowing pills, but generally they're pretty easy to swallow. Six capsules is the equivalent of about an ounce of organ meat. So even six capsules a day would be a good improvement. Um, if people want to do more, 12 would probably be better, you know, and you can mix. So you might do six capsules of two or three different organs or split them up throughout the day. And it's not a, it's not a supplement. It's just food in a mm -hmm. capsule. The other thing that you can do with these, if you want is just open the capsule and put it on food. If you don't want to swallow a bunch of capsules, you can just mix it into a smoothie. Or you can just take the capsules and throw them into something like a broth or, or a, you know, a, something else and they'll just dissolve and you can get all the organs that way. So however it works for people, but you know, six is probably the, the minimum. And then, you know, you can take as many as you want to get the organs. I think you, people will start to see benefit with as few as three to six capsules a day, um, with them, you know, just starting. Yeah, I really like that. So it, this is a completely different endeavor. I assume you're partnering with someone or a group of people. How did like how did you take your first steps into establishing this? So it was kind of this happened organically too. I had I had um, you know um, a number of people say you should do this, and I thought, of course. I mean, of course, I want to do this. And so basically, it was a matter of just finding the right business partner who had experience in the supply chain and, and in this type of thing to help us bring these to market and then kind of collaborating with that person because you're right, it's, it's hard to have every piece of it. You know, like I, I understand why to do it. I've taken these in the past, but, but I don't know about the New Zealand supply chain for organs. And, and I don't know about, you know, margins or purchase orders or this machine or that machine. So finding somebody with that knowledge really completed the picture. And um, it, it has, you know, resulted in a, in a collaboration of sorts. But it's, um, I think that that's a lot of the time, that's what has to happen is people come together and they say, I know this stuff, you know this stuff, let's do it together. Um, I wish I knew it all, but I, I don't. <laughs> so, yeah. How did yeah. you find that person to collaborate with? It just, it, you know, it happened organically. It was a person that just was kind of aligned with me ideologically and they, you know, I, I said, Hey, I want to do this. And they said, yeah, let's do it. I, I can help you with that. We can get all this stuff going. And, and they were just, they were sort of on the same page. I think that that's, that's really the idea that it's, you know, somebody that I knew that I was friends with that, that had an interest in this and was kind of living similarly and saw the, saw the, the demand and saw the opportunity in the same way that I did. Mm -hmm. And I think network is so valuable. I mean, you're building the community, the broad community, but it's like, it's what you know and who you know that that really gets us to where we're going. We just, we end up doing this. Yeah. We do this all together. And do you have any advice for someone in building their network in establishing that, like those strong connections of other, other doers of other creators that can then help build you up while you help build them up? Yeah. The, um, you know, the, the relationships are, are so important, you know, I've been listening to this book on audio, uh, Seven Habits of Highly, of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And he talks about this, you know, that relationships are, are critical. And I couldn't agree more. For me, it was I was fortunate that it happened organically. I think by doing my podcast and being in the space, I met so many cool people. And, and that's what I would say. It's, it's kind of like people ask this question all the time. How do you meet someone in a dating sense that that would be a good fit for you? And I, the answer that, I mean, I'm not a I'm not, I, don't, I guess I'm not great at this because I'm still single, but whatever. But, you know, the answer that I've always heard, I think I've asked my friends that, like, how the heck am I going to meet somebody? And they always say, like, you do the things that you like to do and you should meet that person organically if we're foregoing the online dating idea. And so I think that it's the same in the space. Like, if you are doing the things that you're interested in organically, you will connect with other people and you may connect with them virtually first and then perhaps in person. But just by doing this, I'm connecting with people by doing my podcast, by doing other people's podcasts, Josh, I connect with you and other people. And so 
this organic connection around a shared idea or vision or intention to add value to other people's lives is, is just this um, kind of natural fertile ground for these relationships. And the advice I would have for people is don't undervalue those, foster them because they're, they're everything. They're really the glue. And it is about creating this tribe within a tribe of people that can help you or help you with this or that, or help you with various uh, projects that you may not know about. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. And yeah. um, not to take too much more of your time, because this is, this is awesome, but just a, a few more questions. Um, in terms of your entrepreneurial journey, what's something that you wish you knew early on that you would maybe do differently or just something you wish you knew? Oh, man. Uh, I think that for, maybe because of what I do, maybe this happens to everyone. I don't know. I think that what I do is controversial. And so I wish someone had said, don't pay attention to the haters from day one. That was That's the most stressful part is I think that ideas today that are going to gain traction are going to be polarizing. And they're going to be controversial most of the time. And so you're going to have haters, you know, <laughs> you're going to have haters. And I, I wish I'd really embraced just the fact that that was going to come and that that was perhaps an indication of success and that I could just appreciate the way that those people were helping me refine my message and not to let it bother me at all, just to kind of look past it and just move on. Um, because I think I lost a lot of sleep and a lot of stress around that. And the second thing was just that I've learned over time to not lose track. And I had to reconsider this repeatedly to not lose track of the reason I'm doing it, you know, to kind of have that like focus and mission for me, it easily became about ego. And that's been a struggle for me. You start to get success and then you don't want to be wrong. <laughs> and then you want to defend your name. And it's about getting on this podcast or that podcast or being this much of a bestseller or that much of a bestseller. And you start comparing and it's ego. It's like, I want people to realize how good Paul Saladino is. And that's bullshit. Like that's, that's stupid. And of course that's human, but it was much, and that's what it, it really only hurt me in the end because it created insurmountable stress. It was just unmanageable to think, what if this doesn't go good, then I'm going to lose everything. And it's like, wait a minute, like if it doesn't go good, then I made a mistake and I'll go back to just creating something that brings value to someone else's life, which is why, why I'm doing this in the first place. So for me, it's been this struggle letting go of that ego and, and, and not doing it for the ego. And I didn't start doing it for the ego, but once you start getting success, it's easy to start doing it for the ego or to have the ego drive you. But the ego just keeps you up at night. You think, oh, what am I doing? What's my reputation? Am I growing enough? How much success am I getting? Am I better than this person or that person? And you know, it's, it's, uh, it's vulnerable and embarrassing to admit that, but I'm susceptible like anyone else is. So the more I'm able to step back from that and say, I'm doing this just to add value to someone else's life. And if the whole thing blows up in a fiery inferno, I did my part and I spoke with a true and authentic voice, then I'll move on to something else. It's fine. Like it's, it's just, it's so much less stressful to think. It doesn't matter. If I can just put my ego aside and remember why I'm doing it, that's an easier thing. So those are the two pieces. Forget the trolls and, and don't do it for ego. Yeah, that's wonderful advice. And I think that's a great note to to close on. So you mentioned the Carnivore Code, your book. Where should people um, check that out, check you out, follow along and learn more? So the Carnivore Code, the second edition is coming out August the 4th. You can pre-order it, thecarnivorecodebook.com. It's available everywhere. There's an audio book, which I recorded in my voice. And that's the place for the book. My website is carnivoremd.com where you can find all my stuff, links to my podcast and all my socials there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this. And yeah, this was a really great chat. I'm sure people are going to get a ton out of it and I really appreciate it. So my pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me on, man. And I hope people will check out the stuff. We dived into so much and I hope they will just, if they're curious about this, really um, challenge a lot of held beliefs. There's so much cognitive dissonance that happens here. And the fun and exciting thing about writing a book that challenges the status quo is like my ideas are out there and people can read about them and it's, it's all there for people to read. So I encourage them to check it out if it challenges your paradigm. Excellent. Love it. Awesome. So yeah, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, man. I can't wait. Okay. See ya. See ya, man. I want to thank Paul for joining us today. I hope you really enjoyed that episode. Be sure to check out everything Paul's up to at carnivoremd.com and definitely check out his book, The Carnivore Code. If you find it anywhere near as interesting as I do, I think you're really going to enjoy this book. 
Anyway, that's carnivoremd.com. As always, this episode of Starting Now is brought to you by Built. At Built, we help you get started online. Whether you want to start a blog or a business, head on over to built.co. That's B-Y-L-T dot C-O to get started. Built. Your website, built for you, simply. Finally, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, be sure to check out the video version of the show on YouTube. You'll find all the links for this episode at built.co slash zero one zero. That's a B-Y-L-T dot C-O slash zero one zero. And that'll do it for this week. Again, I'm Jeff Saris, and this has been Starting Now, and I'll see you next time.